Good morning. Welcome to a nice, bright and early session. Um, you get special points for being here instead of being outside and having coffee. And uh, we look forward, our aim is to be the most interesting panel of the day. And we would like you to be the most interesting audience of the day. So we are very keen to know what you think about what we are talking about this morning. And uh, we would like you to busily be writing down questions that you would like answered while you hear our presentations. My name is Dr Bronwyn King. I'm a radiation oncologist from Australia and I am the CEO um, and the founder of Tobacco Free Portfolios, which is an NGO based out in Australia, but we have a global outreach and, um, and we have now made an impact in 20 countries. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce to you a stellar panel uh, up here on the stage today. And I know that you could read their biographies on the app or on the internet, but I want to just take you through a few key things about each person so you realise the calibre of the people we have with us today. First of all, here we have Pavan Sukhdev. He's the president of WWF, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And he's the founder and CEO of GIST Advisory, which is a unique advisory firm which helps governments and corporations deliver, measure, value and manage their impact on natural and human capital. He's a scientist by education. He's an international banker by training, but an environmental economist by passion. And he's led and advised many UN and international environmental initiatives. His book, Corporation 2020, was published in 2012, and it really challenges the business as usual mindset of the corporate sector, and we look forward to hearing more about that this morning. Now, Pavan has won a very long list of awards in recognition of his remarkable achievements and contributions. I'm just going to tell you three of them today. He was selected as Personality of the Year for 2010 by Environmental Finance. He was appointed a UN Environment Program Goodwill Ambassador uh, back in 2012. And in 2016, he won the prestigious Blue Planet Prize for outstanding achievements in scientific research and its application to solve global, global environmental problems. So a very warm welcome to Pavan. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Ulana Suprun, who served as the Acting Minister of Health of the Ukraine from July 2016 until August 2019. She's the founder and former director of the NGO Patriot Defence, founder of the School for Rehabilitation Medicine at the Ukrainian Catholic University, and the former director of humanitarian initiatives for the Ukrainian World Congress. Now, during her time as minister, Dr. Suprun and her team passed really sweeping transformational healthcare changes, and they passed them into law. Now, the new systems that she established focused on primary care, provided state insurance for every Ukrainian citizen, established a guaranteed package of healthcare services, increased healthcare workers' salaries to market levels, cut corruption and bribes in the medical system, and offered a reimbursement for medicines programs for patients suffering from chronic diseases. Now, if we put that into statistics, as an indication of the success of Dr. Suprin's changes, in one year, more than 28 million Ukrainians signed up for her new healthcare system. So thank you, Dr. Suprin, for being here with us today. Mark Saunders is a group executive member of AIA. Now, AIA is the largest listed pure life and health insurer in the world with a market capitalisation of more than US $125 billion. Now, Mark is responsible for AIA's strategy and corporate development, and he drives the strategic evolution of AIA, moving from being beyond what most people understand is a traditional insurer, which is an organisation that steps in when times are really tough, to instead being a partner for life. And we look forward to hearing more about that evolution in Mark's presentation. 
Mr Saunders has also held numerous executive and non-executive board director positions and he's a member of many different insurance related actuarial regulatory and professional committees. I also found it very interesting he has a postgraduate certificate for education in a range of things including phys ed and he was a schoolmaster and an amateur boxing trainer. He also coaches a variety of children's rugby and football teams in Hong Kong and he's fresh off the plane after being very lucky to go and watch the, um, the Rugby World Cup semi-final, England versus the All Blacks, and he's looking smug because, because England won. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Ruben Zandvliet. He's an environmental, social, and ethical risk advisor at ABN AMRO. Now, ABN AMRO is the third largest bank in the Netherlands. It has 20,000 employees and offices in 15 countries and controls around 200 million euro of assets under management. Now, Ruben focuses on the bank's human rights program, and he has a focus on lending activities in high-risk sectors. Now, in 2017, ABN AMRO was one of the first major commercial banks to exclude tobacco from lending services. And a year later, tobacco manufacturers were excluded from the investment universe at ABN AMRO. And the bank is a signatory to the Tobacco Free Finance Pledge. Before joining ABN AMRO, Ruben worked as a policy officer for a member of parliament in the Netherlands in constitutional law, corporate law, and corporate social responsibility. He studied public international law, and in 2019, he defended his PhD thesis on the legal framework of economic globalisation and labour. Ruben has published a number of articles and book chapters on business and human rights and on the interactions between international economic law and labour. Thank you for joining us this morning, Ruben. So now I'd like to bring up my presentation, if I may. Uh, no, let's go back. If we can... There we go, change that over. So just, I'm just going to provide a brief context of the topic that we're talking about today. Now, the reason I'm up here as a radiation oncologist is because as an oncologist, we know full well the devastating impact of tobacco. And in my clinical work in my very early years, I, I saw really from a front row seat what tobacco did to people. And many people will be aware that the World Health Organization made this prediction some time ago that the world's on track for one billion tobacco-related deaths this century. There's only seven billion of us. So this really is a problem of catastrophic proportions. And it's not going to be fixed by governments alone. It's not going to be fixed by the health sector alone. It's going to need every segment of society to line up and be part of the solution on this issue. So at Tobacco Free Portfolios, we work with the global finance sector, and by that I mean we work with big banks, big insurers, big pension funds, and big asset managers, and we ask them to rethink tobacco. And the status quo at the moment is that all of those financial organisations invest in tobacco, lend money to tobacco companies, and insure tobacco companies. And many people here are really from the health sector and understand that that's not helpful to us at all. That really undermines our work. So we've reached out to the finance sector and asked them to rethink business as usual. This uh, work started in Australia with pension funds, but now, as I said, we've had an impact in 20 countries. And last year, we launched an initiative at the UN called the Tobacco Free Finance Pledge. We launched this event with the support of President Macron and also the Australian Prime Minister. And this was at the launch at United Nations headquarters on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in New York last year. And as you can see at this event, we were very lucky that Dr. Tedros came along to support it. Um, Dr. Vera da Costa, the head of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, was there. We had the Health Minister of France, the Health Minister of the Netherlands. And all the people at the back there are CEOs and chairmen of some of the world's biggest financial organisations committing to really rethinking tobacco and moving to tobacco-free finance. And so as of today, there are 123 signatories to the pledge. And these really do constitute some of the world's biggest financial organisations. So some of the really big ones that you might know are BNP Paribas, the biggest bank in Europe, ABP, the biggest uh, pension fund in Europe, and also AXA, one of the biggest insurers in the world. These 
organisations control a combined total of almost eight trillion US dollars and have a corporate loan book of two trillion dollars. So this is sort of our background. Now, the topic today is talking about the commercial determinants of health. And apart from tobacco, there are a lot of other industries that are involved in this discussion. And these are some symbols that really represent many of them. So we have alcohol and guns, we have oil, cannabis, we have sugar and palm oil, we have water, pharmaceutical industry, um, human rights, ocean plastic. There's a whole range of issues where the corporate sector and the way it acts has a big impact on the community in terms of public health. And these are some of the more common ones. I wanted to include a new one that I haven't really thought of before, which is the apparel industry. If you have a look on the left here, this woman is modelling a hoodie which has a built-in vaping device. And I recently read a blog where this was being promoted as a great way to hide your vaping from your parents. So maybe we need to start working with the apparel industry. We also have here a tech product which I've not seen before. It looks a lot like an Apple product, it's not. But in addition to being a watch, when you unplug it from the wristband, it becomes a vaping device. So you can see that um, there, are, there are many things that we need to be working on in the health sector to improve our relationships with corporate players. I also wanted to mention the role of philanthropy because a lot of philanthropy has come because of great success in the corporate sector. And many of you are obviously familiar with um, Gates and Bloomberg who've set up incredible foundations that have then channeled some of those profits, a lot of those profits, into very meaningful impacts on global health in terms of malaria and, and tobacco for those examples. Uh, many of you will know about Elon Musk of Tesla fame who has recently uh, committed to helping the people of Flint in the USA uh, filter their water so that they can have safe access to water. So it's interesting how these profits from the corporate success can in fact be channeled into public good. And this is a picture here of Mackenzie Bezos, who's just divorced from Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame. Now, Jeff came under a lot of pressure because he hadn't been such a big contributor to the philanthropic sector, but Mackenzie, who has just now finished the divorce settlement, has ended up with almost $40 billion to her name, and she recently just signed the giving pledge, stating that she's going to give away at least half of that in her lifetime, and she listed the health sector as one of her areas of interest. So it's interesting how success in the corporate sector can sometimes lead to good health impacts for the community. And then I did want to point out that many of you would have seen that at the World Economic Forum this year, the Dutch historian and author Rutger Bregman made a comment about um, how uh, philanthropy is, his quote was, philanthropy is not a substitute for democracy or proper taxation or a good welfare state. And if we look at the Amazon example there, one of the reasons why Jeff Bezos um, has been the richest man in the world is because last year Amazon made $11 billion in profits and they paid zero dollars of corporate tax. So it's uh, a very good example to be a springboard for our conversation today. There is hope though. BlackRock is one of the biggest asset owners in the world. They control six trillion dollars. And every year the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, has been writing a letter to all the companies that BlackRock holds shares in, which is virtually the entire investable universe in the world. And he writes to those CEOs of all those companies and is increasingly demanding them to outline, uh, he's, he's demanding that they outline their purpose. So rather than just be a business per se, what is the purpose of the business? What is the impact of the business on the community and what are they doing about it? Now, there's a bit of criticism that this is just words and no action, but it's good to see the words for a start. Also this year, just in August, there's an organisation called the Business Roundtable, which is a collection of the biggest businesses in the USA. And 181 of their CEOs issued this new declaration that challenged the thinking of business up until recently. The, the thinking has always been that the exclusive role of business is to make money for shareholders. And that's it. And in this new letter, this new declaration, 181 of these CEOs, big, big company CEOs, said, in fact, now is the time for us to rethink that and, in fact, look at our whole supply chain. 
look at the people who are working on farms and making the products that we sell, look at people working in the factories, look at our own workers, make sure they're treated in a respectful way and paid a living wage, look at our customers and look at the community in the impact of our business on the environment and the social aspect of the community. Now this only came out in August, but this is really potentially a, a tipping point in time for the business sector and it will be interesting to see how businesses implement this kind of thinking. There are many different UN initiatives um, that call on the business community to step up to the plate and be part of global solutions. And you'll be familiar with many of these here. For example, the global UN Global Compact is considered the corporate social responsibility arm of the UN and it's a whole group of businesses that work together to share information about how to work towards a more sustainable world for people and the planet. Um, if we go through here on the left-hand side, there are now four initiatives of the UN that look at the finance sector. And uh, interestingly, the one on the top left is a new program. It's called the Principles for Responsible Banking. It's just been launched one month ago during the UN General Assembly. And there are 130 banks in the world that have signed up to this initiative to share information about what it means to be a responsible bank in 2019. And a final one to mention is just last week, hot off the press, um, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, has convened a new group. It's called the Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance. And it's 30 of the world's biggest investors. And he's asked them all to come together to work towards tilting their businesses to create a more sustainable world. There's no way that we're going to achieve the SDGs without the input of the corporate sector. And, uh, but it certainly does mean that it's a lot of change is required, there's a lot of discussions to be had, and um, we're really only at the start of the journey. So that's the context for today. I would now like to welcome uh, Pavan Sukdev to the stage to hear his opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, Great to be here with, with all of you and on a topic that's dear to our hearts and uh, very close to uh, my current uh, work, both in my company as well as with the WWF. Uh, I'll pick on two themes, Bronwyn, that you, you mentioned. One was on the issue of taxation and the other was on impacts and the importance of declaring them. Uh, uh, on taxation, one of the US presidents, uh, uh, Wilson, actually said, that a tax is nothing but an impost you pay for membership of a civilized society. And when I hear that a large corporation like Amazon or Apple or whoever is paying no tax, then I'm wondering what's the situation here? Are they not members of civilized society or is it that society is not civilized? And neither of those options are really particularly impressive. And uh, I'll come to that theme in terms of the role of the corporation as a driver of our economy. Two thirds of the economy and jobs, by the way, are private sector. It is the uh, weight of the uh, corporation today that drives the economy in the direction that it goes and drives pretty much two thirds of all environmental impacts. It is actually the emissions and the pollutions and so on of the corporate sector that in fact determine our inexorable march to planetary boundaries. And that leads to the other point, Bronwyn, that you mentioned during your, your presentation, which is on impact, which is that how often do we actually measure impacts of corporations beyond their impact on their shareholders. We all measure and we have to measure profit because that's the impact on shareholder financial capital. But how much and how often do we ever measure their impacts on nature, natural capital, or on their employees' health and well-being and, and, and uh, capacities, that is human capital, or indeed on the relationships in society, that social capital. And that's a thought to bear in mind. I want to begin by looking at the food system and uh, remind ourselves that it's not doing particularly well. This is a little simplified Venn diagram based on numerous WHO statistics, which talks about the fact that we still have 815 million people who go to bed hungry, and they are among a two billion number who is micronutrient deficient. And at the same time, we have obesity affecting more than 700 million uh, people, and we have almost two billion overweight. And by the way, there are intersections, as you can see. Uh, the overweight and the obese are not necessarily uh, nutritious in the way that they, they feed. 
Our food system is supposed to deliver health and nutrition, but instead, clearly, that's not happening because uh, if we quote the Global Nutrition Report 2016, diet is now the number one risk factor for the global burden of disease. Just diabetes has more than 400 million sufferers now, and that's a number that is nearly four times what it was in 1980. And the global prevalence of diabetes has gone up from under 5% to over 8% uh, in the same period from 1980 to 2014. Uh, the costs, the annual costs, the public health costs of treating diabetes are upwards of 850 billion per annum. That's almost a trillion dollars. These are diet-related, and then there are input-related diseases, the antibiotic resistance that comes from the excessive use of antibiotics in order to make livestock produce more milk and sometimes to prevent diseases in livestock. Then there's the increasingly uh, uh, m strong connection that is being demonstrated and indeed litigated between herbicides use, uh, glyphosates especially, and, and cancer risk. And of course, then there's endocrine disruption, which if we just look at the costs of endocrine disruption and related ailments that come from it, just for the European Union, a study was done by the University of New York, which estimated that at 150 billion euros per annum. That is not a small bill for health costs of just endocrine disruption. The biggest driver of endocrine disruption is the use of pesticides. The second biggest, by the way, is plastics. So plastics again comes up in, in this context. So here we have it, today's food system. But the question is, if these are the public losses, if these are the public costs, where are the private profits? Well, you know what? They're there. And we are talking about here in terms of diabetes and the marketing and communications sort of uh, juggernaut that pushes sugar-laden beverages, sugar-sweetened beverages, that's SSB. The food and beverage industry benefits from that. They are the ones making the profit. The sugar-sweetened beverages industry benefits from that. And when we look at the other sides, well, meat, excessive meat consumption, the meat industry benefits. If we look at antibiotic resistance and where, who makes these antibiotics, well, it is the pharmaceutical industry. And of course, which industry is driving it? Is it the dairy industry and, and the meat industry again? So if we look at herbicides and, and pesticides, it's the agrochemical sector. I mean, the, the famous problems of um, the costs of cancer and the fact that so much research has been hidden away and, and not brought to the table thanks to search engine optimization and, and other such devices. These are things that are driven by the private sector. So here we have it. Private profits, public losses. Private profits, public losses. Can this go on? Is, is, this, is this kind of uh, uh, musical chairs possible to go on forever? Or is it the case that externalities, corporate externalities, that is the third party costs of doing business as usual, has become truly the biggest free lunch in the history of the universe? An estimate was made a few years ago in 2013 that private sector externalities of just the top 100 sectors and regions, and the top 100 industries and the top 100 locations where they are, is almost $4.7 trillion per annum. That's like 13 odd percent of the global GDP, just the top 100 sectors. So um, we have a, a problem of vast proportions and a particularly in the food systems area because not only are we ignoring the uh, public costs of health, but we are also ignoring the climate costs and the two are connected. If we look at greenhouse gas emissions, the assumption always is it's all about oil and gas, but it's not. If we take the deforestation that takes place to clear the land that grows the beef and grows the corn and grows the soya, and if we take the, the transportation costs of transporting all that food across different parts of the world, and we take the, th the emissions from the 30% of food that is actually wasted either on the field or thrown out in the homes, if we account for all of those, the entire value chain of food, the answer is that accounts for 43 to 57% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. So you can say half the emissions are actually also food system. And some of the biggest challenges here are how do we understand the connections between climate and food? And I know that this conference is doing a lot in, in that, uh, towards that goal. But there are solutions. We can actually get away from this somewhat limited lens approach that we have today of analyzing food systems purely as if the only thing that matters is per hectare productivity. We can actually look at food systems by measuring not just productivity, which is the economic side, but also looking at employment, also looking at human health costs, and I gave you an example on endocrine disruption, also looking at the climate costs, and we do have those calculations, and indeed looking at the costs on water and soil. 
and further down the line. So the idea that you can only kind of take a narrow lens view of the food systems and only look at one, one scalar out of a whole range of this vector of performance of food systems, that idea has come and gone. And today we have with us from last year the report which I was uh, privileged to lead, which was in fact led by Alexander Muller, who is an ex-German agriculture secretary, and I was managing the, the whole process. Uh, we pulled together something like 150 leading academicians across the world of food, agriculture, health, and we had included in that the FAO and the WHO. And this report has received, received a lot of consensus and, and recognition, and already about six, seven studies have begun applying this report to actual food systems examples. So I think the way forward is clear. We need to measure food systems performance beyond productivity per hectare, include the impacts especially on health and climate. Good information isn't an answer in itself. You need to use that information to engage farmers, engage the public, engage mothers in the health of their children, finally engage the policymakers, and eventually present all of that powerfully to the private sector and ask them for change. And this ask really has to come from people. So therefore, you know, we need, if you like, a Greta Thunberg of the food system as well to emerge somewhere along the line to make that voice heard. There are other solutions. We can also ask for the drivers of these problems to start reporting them properly. And even though five years ago, and certainly 10 years ago, reporting the impacts of a system or a business on human health and human education and nature and, and social constructs and so on was not possible because this diagram shows you how vast and diverse are the impacts of a typical business. A typical multinational business doesn't only impact the profits of its shareholders, which is the top left-hand box, the produced capital which comes under private ownership, but it also impacts the human capital of its employees and indeed of the communities where it operates and indeed in terms of public health. So these are all elements of human capital. And of course it impacts national capital because it may be using mines and fields and, and private forests. And at the same time, it also impacts social capital, which is all the relationships that bind these other revenue producing capitals together in our society. Social capital itself doesn't generate incomes, but without it, nothing else is effective in doing so. So social capital is the binding force, and the role of the corporation in influencing that is absolutely important. Yes, five years ago, it was not possible to measure these, but the great news is that today it is, and I'm looking forward, Ruben, to, to your comments, because I know that your bank has made, taken some leadership steps in measuring this so-called integrated profit and loss your impacts not just on your shareholders, but also on all of your other major stakeholders, your employees, society at large, and nature. And finally, when we recognize the role of the corporation today as a business, not just as a box that makes machine for shareholders, but at, as in fact the most important institution of our times because it is two thirds of the economy and jobs. Finally, when we start measuring its real performance in all these dimensions, only then will we have the reality in front of us. And only then can we actually make the changes that we need, which will be in the area of reporting for performance, taxation, finance, and so on. All of these areas that, that concern us and which we know need to be addressed. We will then have the arguments to do that in a forceful way. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I'm sure that my presentation will be up in just a second. Um, I am, uh, was the Acting Minister of Health of Ukraine for a little over three years, and um, that's the longest serving Minister of Health since the uh, independence of Ukraine in 1991. Um, as Dr. King pointed out, we did do a lot of changes uh, within the ministry. Uh, we did a lot of changes in Ukraine where we introduced, uh, basically transformed the healthcare system and introduced uh, a better way of paying as well as keeping track of what's happening with people's health. But no impact can be made on only treatment of the healthcare system when... Um, Can I just wait a minute for the moment? Uh -huh. There you go. Um, no matter how well we finance uh, treatment of illnesses, no matter how well we uh, change our uh, uh, 
medical education. And uh, no matter how much we try to introduce new pharmaceuticals, we really can't affect the health of our population unless we have public health programs which prevent the illness, which keep our people healthy, and which make them more productive. We've already heard the impact of tobacco. We've heard the impact of food. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the impact of something different, something that we have a big problem with in Ukraine, and that's air pollution. Most recently, in the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, there was a study published that uh, revealed that 8.9 million people die every year because of air pollution. They did a meta-analysis of multiple studies in the past, and there has been an underestimation of the effect of air pollution on people's lives. These are the top 10 polluting businesses in Ukraine. Most of them are steelworks, or possibly some of them also produce energy, electrical energy, and out of those, six are owned by a single owner. Those are six of the 10 most polluting businesses in Ukraine. They're owned by Rinat Akhmetov, who is an oligarch, and 847 million tons of emissions have come from his factories in 2018. These two companies have shown a profit of almost 13, uh, 12 billion uh, dollars in 2018, the same year that those emissions were recorded. None of this money has been invested in cleaning up the air, and currently as we speak, there's a big investment conference going on in Mariupol, one of the cities where there's the worst of the factories, and the president of Ukraine, the prime minister of Ukraine, and multiple investors from around the world have come to the city to invest in our country. What did Rinat Akhmetov do? He closed the factory for a week and gave everyone a vacation so that the president wouldn't see what actually is happening in the town. 180,000 people were hospitalized for respiratory illness in Mariupol last year alone, which is five times higher than those in similar sized cities in uh, Western Ukraine. Another problem we have in Ukraine is over medication. All of these are advertisements for medicines that are on television or in newspapers or on the internet. The top 10 drugs sold in pharmacies are listed here. You see how many million dollars were uh, made by the pharmaceutical companies in each of these different drugs. Four of these have absolutely no clinical effect. The second one, Octovehin, is produced from the blood of calves. It is a catch-all that physicians tell patients to take when they can't figure out any other reason for their illnesses. Heptrol is a um, hepatoprotector, so it's a bunch of vitamins that are given to supposedly help the liver. The other two are basically uh, combinations of uh, homeopathic medicines and vitamins. 52% of Ukrainians have taken medicine on the advice of friends or Google rather than seeing their physician, and 69% of Ukrainians self-medicate, never having seen a physician. This is because 30 to 50% of TV ads are advertising of medicines. I was shocked myself when I appeared on television in talk shows or during interviews, and afterwards saw the ads that had surrounded my appearance on television. 100% of them were advertisements of pharmaceuticals. And there are laws in Ukraine that regulate the advertising of pharmaceuticals. The company spent almost $43 million on TV advertising in 2016, of which a single company was taken to court for not, uh, not, uh, um, for, um, uh, not properly advertising and uh, breaking the law and regulations, they were fined $2 million and in a higher level court, in the appellate court, the uh, ruling was overturned and the company did not have to pay for it. The Ministry of Health has developed a new draft law on pharmaceutical advertising, which limits pharmaceutical advertising so that it doesn't target children. There are stricter rules 
they're um, uh, a lot more, a lot closer to the EU regulations on advertising. However, the law wasn't passed by our uh, parliament because very many representatives from the pharmaceutical industry actually have representatives in our parliament. So what does this mean? This means that in Ukraine, we can pay millions and billions of dollars on treating patients after they've become ill. But unless we can partner with business so that they take responsibility for what they're doing to the environment or how they're convincing to take the medicines that really aren't necessary and people are spending their disposable income unwisely, we will never be able to actually impact Ukrainians' health. Ukrainians live on average 10 years shorter than our European neighbors. The reason is not because there isn't enough money being spent on health care. The reason is because the environment and uh, the uh, corporate community is not taking responsibility for its part in helping Ukrainians stay healthy. Renat Akhmetov, the oligarch who basically controls Mariupol and is making over $12 billion every year off of his investments in the steel making and energy um, uh, industries, spent $25 million on elections in 2015 in Mariupol. He controls the mayor's office and he controls the uh, city council. His company pays 23% of taxes. However, all of those taxes are going to treat the illnesses that his company produces. Another problem is that when government gets involved as a partner with the oligarchs, it doesn't help us as well. Yes, Akhmetov's factory have paid $11 million in fines because of the pollution that they're producing. However, in uh, balance with the $12 billion that they're making, for them it's a drop in the bucket. The government also needs to take a stand and needs to uh, take more responsibility in regulating and controlling those actions of the industry, whether it's in steel making or whether it's in the advertising industry, and only a partnership between government, civil society, and business will help to change the health of the world. Because Ukraine is a microcosm of that which is happening in many uh, low and middle income countries. Luckily, we're able to talk about it. Luckily, we're able to have some impact on it to talk to audiences like yourselves. So please, take a look at what's happening around you in your own countries. Help us to be able to make an impact in our own countries. And I think that someday we will have a healthier world in which our children are breathing clean air and they're not watching false advertising of medicines on television. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Mark, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning. Um, as, uh, as Bronwyn promised you at the start, we're trying to make this the most interesting panel uh, session. I've noticed nobody is yet asleep, so we're halfway through. Um, but as also, as Bronwyn said, I, I've traveled in, it took me 19 hours to get here from Tokyo. So this may be a first for you, the first time you've ever seen a presenter fall asleep. But I'll, I'll do my best to stay awake during my own presentation, because that wouldn't be too good. Right, I, I want to share with you um, something about AIA. We're a life and health insurance company. Oh, it looks like we're having trouble with these uh, connections again. Bear with me. Or is it just these connections here? Have a look at that. No problem. There you go. Okay. Nearly. Okay, good. Right, so, as Bronwyn said in the introduction, I've lived and worked in Asia for 30 years, uh, based in Hong Kong since 1989. Um, AIA just operates across the Asia-Pacific markets. That's 18 markets, but again, as Bronwyn said in the introduction, we're 125 billion US dollar market cap. To give that context to you here, uh, if you take Allianz here in Germany, a massive global insurer, we're 20 to 25% bigger than them. We're twice the size of uh, AXA and Zurich, two and a half times the size of Peru, three to three and a half times of Met and Prudential of the, of the US, the biggest American companies, three and a half times of Manulife, four times Generali, and six times of Viva. So how can that be? 
because we only operate in Asia. We're not global like all those other big names. Um, the reason is we have immense, immense structural drivers of growth uh, in a, across our markets. Just again, some statistics. Compared to the G7 countries, if you take the, the markets of, of which AIA operates, uh, we have something in the order of four times the population of the G7 countries, twice the urban population, and over the next two years, we'll create eight times the wealth of the G7 countries. Hence why we, could, we enjoy such, such size and, and, and dominance in the markets we're in. But this wealth creation that we're getting in Asia, although people say that's great to create wealth, it's not necessarily meaning people are getting healthier. In fact, as they're getting wealthier, they're getting lazy, they're eating too much, and they're not e eating well, and they're smoking, and they're drinking too much alcohol. These are key risk drivers of NCDs, as you know, non-communicable diseases, which in our markets accounts for just over three quarters of all deaths, um, and 80% of the disease burden across our markets. Countries across Asia are facing an ever-growing protection gap, and what that is, that's the shortfall in terms of coverage people have if they suffer from mortality, if they die, or morbidity from ill health, of, of the order of $100 trillion. So there's a, there's a lot of work for us to do as AIA. Even though we're the biggest pan-Asian insurer, there's still a lot of insurance that is needed. Uh, and this is where we come in, by providing financial protection and reducing that social welfare burden. Now, all of this leads me to the biggest social and economic issue facing the world today, in my opinion, if I may. And that's related to aging, but paradoxically, the potent combination of aging and ill health, with people making too many poor lifestyle choices and adversely impacting their health. We can keep people alive a lot longer now through medical advancements. 120 could be the new norm. And typically, if I ask people, do you want to live to 120, most people say, well, not really. However, that's because in our minds, we've got a vision of 120-year-olds not being in particularly good health. If I said you could live to 120 and be as healthy as you are now, or as healthy as you were 10 years ago, are you interested? Then perhaps. And then we come to the next big risk of outliving our savings. So we're facing a world now where we've got many more elderly people potentially living to 120, and particularly in our Asian markets. Uh, Hong Kong enjoys the longest longevity in the world of around 89 now for females. It's not going to be long before it's 120. So living to 120 with potentially those last 40 years from 80 to 120 in ill health and with no money. Old, ill health, no money, becoming an unbearable burden. Nobody wants that. So we're facing that unattractive potential bleak future. That's the massive social and economic issue facing the world. But what can be done about it? What can the private sector do? What can a life and health insurance company do about this social and economic issue facing us? Well, what we can do is we can evolve to become more proactive, using shared value as our philosophy, more of a partner than just a reactive a payer of claims. And at AIA, we're leading that evolution across our markets. And I'm proud to say that many of our competitors are following us in doing this. So rather than just waiting for an event to happen, and by an event I mean somebody getting ill or dying, rather than just waiting for that, which is historically what we've done, and being reactive and then pe making a payment, how about becoming proactive and intervening to mitigate and delay that risk of the event happening? So of the risk of people getting ill and dying earlier than they could do. Could we intervene? Could we get ahead of that event and actually do what we should do as an insurance company and actively manage that risk? So paying to help mitigate the risk rather than passively waiting for the bad event to happen and then paying. By the way, this not only makes sense for life and health insurers to do, it also makes sense for governments to do. Rather than wait for people to get sick, and then why not try to keep them healthy? The current model that we call healthcare isn't healthcare at all. It's sick care. So let's be proactive and practice healthcare, keeping people healthier for longer. So at AI, 
as I say in the centre of this slide, that we make a positive difference to people's lives by helping them improve their health and well-being. We provide the knowledge, the tools, the encouragement through rewards and an ecosystem of partners to help people improve their health journeys across the stages of predict, prevent, diagnose, treat and recover. So really getting ahead and trying to prevent these illnesses and delay the onset of death. And we provide financial protection in times of need, of course. In short, we're providing better health comes and improved well-being for our customers. So let me just provide a little more, more detail by going through the framework that we use at AIA. So we have this differentiated health and well-being strategic framework, moving from a payer, evolving from a payer, to a partner. So let me um, highlight a couple of examples of, of, of how we do it and, and what we do. On the left, we've got a program called AIA Vitality. Now, that's an award-winning program um, that we're honoured to be part of. Um, we encourage people to make the right lifestyle choices. Eat less and eat better, be active, don't drink alcohol, and don't smoke. And we use behavioural economics to drive this long-term behavioural change to try to make the healthy lifestyle choices become a lifetime habit. We make them aware of their health, we provide the tools and pathways to improve their health and well-being, and encourage them and reward them for doing so through this AIA Vitality program. Now those rewards to make people move a bit, so track their steps, eat better, go for medical checkups, stop smoking and drink less alcohol, if they can demonstrate that, that to us that they're getting healthier, we give them rewards and simple things as QR codes on, on their phones. QR codes for a free cup of coffee. You'll be amazed that people will walk 10,000 steps a day or whatever we set them as their standard for a week in order to enjoy a free cup of coffee. They will do it for a free cinema ticket. They will do it for healthy food discounts or points on a partner rewards program or donations to charity or a discount on their insurance premium, or increased benefits on their insurance policy. Different people are motivated by different factors. So we've got to find and personalize what makes you tick, what will make you move around a bit more than you normally do, so walk, and eat less, but eat better. What will encourage you to do that? Once we find that, we will reward you for doing that. So we will pay for you making these better lifestyle choices. And as a further part of our differentiated health and well-being strategic framework, we've got this thing on the right-hand side, this medics. Because no matter how healthy you try to keep people, for one means or another, people still get ill. And so with it, we've got an exclusive partnership uh, with this medics, which is a personal medical case management service provider. And through our ecosystems of partners with proven clinical efficacy, so not these ad adverts like you get in the Ukraine, but proven clinical efficacy of, of partners where they actually do improve people's health outcomes. Uh, we help them get the right diagnosis, the right treatment. We pay towards that treatment and support their recovery. So they're back to living their life and contributing to the society and economy uh, as quickly as possible. So in summary, we're evolving from a reactive, transactional payer to be a proactive service provider and value-adding partner. Evolving from the conventional you die, we pay type model, or you get sick or injured, uh, we pay. Evolving from that to, we'll help keep you alive for longer and healthier for longer, but if you do get sick, injured, have an accident or die, we still pay. But of course, keeping people alive for longer uh, is good for our life insurance business. Keeping them healthier for longer is good for our health insurance business. Helping keep them alive and healthy for longer is good for them, their families, their employers, our business, and societies and economies at large. It's about sustainability and having a positive social impact. It's a pure form of, social, uh, of shared value. Treating a social problem as a business objective unlocks tremendous opportunities for innovation and sustainable value-creating growth for our organization and society and economy at large. I have some statistics, but I'll maybe share those in the q and I just want to quickly move on and conclude now. Just to close, 
So we've got some total assets of just over 250 billion. Remember, our market cap's 125 billion. We're a responsible long-term investor committed to sustainable investment and committed to enabling healthier, longer, better lives for our customers across Asia. When we make an investment decision, we screen for ESG factors. In 2018, we excluded tobacco manufacturing from our investment portfolio, divesting some 500 million US dollars in corporate equities and bonds. We can all give him a big clap for that. Oh, That's thank you. <laughs> so just finally to conclude, together, the people in this room, the people who work for life insurance companies, any government representatives, we can make a real difference. If we work together to improve population health and well-being, we will help keep millions of people healthier for longer. So let's all do our bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you. No uh, PowerPoint <coughs> presentations. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so no uh, loose cables or technical issues. Um, um, thank you, Bronwyn, for the uh, introduction. What I wanted to focus on in my presentation is uh, basically one of the frameworks that uh, Bronwyn already uh, showed on the uh, slide with all these UN initiatives and the principles for responsible banking, investments, etc. cetera. Um, and one of these uh, initiatives uh, really guides me in my uh, daily work as a, a human rights uh, lawyer working for a bank, uh, and that is the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, also known as the RUGGY principles. Uh, but I would be interested to uh, have a show of hands to see how many people are actually familiar with the UN guiding principles or the RUGGY principles. A handful, okay, perfect. So normally I'm presenting at conferences where there are only human rights experts in the room uh, and I don't um, uh, need to explain the introduction, but um, um, always uh, uh, useful, I think, to, to start with that. Uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights were adopted in 2011 by the uh, UN Human Rights Council after extensive preparatory work by John Ruggie uh, as a UN Special Rapporteur on Business and Human Rights, uh, appointed by uh, Kofi Annan uh, in that role. Uh, and his task was basically to break the deadlock between NGOs uh, and businesses. And the dichotomy was that NGOs wanted to have uh, strong regulation, preferably a treaty, uh, with strong human rights obligations that all companies would have to comply with. Uh, and if that would be the case, uh, the whole phenomenon of corporate human rights abuse would end. On the other uh, hand, there was the uh, private sector arguing that this was too complex uh, to be regulated by a treaty, that there were too many differences between companies in, in size and sector, too many differences between all the possible human rights uh, issues that you can encounter uh, as a corporate enterprise. So the best way forward was to leave it up to the private sector uh, and to see this as a, a purely voluntary uh, issue. Of course, the whole issue of business and human rights was not new. Uh, it is as old as uh, private enterprise uh, or transnational enterprise, uh, going back to the, to the 16th, 17th century and companies being involved in the transnational uh, transatlantic uh, slave trade. Um, uh, so it's not a new issue, but only in 2011, the first really authoritative uh, UN sponsored framework was adopted. Um, and the UN guiding principles uh, consist of three pillars. They consist of a pillar uh, addressing the responsibility of government in regulating companies. They consist of a pillar um, stressing the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and they consist of a pillar focused on victims of human rights abuses and the right to remedy. So what uh, do the UN guiding principles ask a company to do? Uh, it's basically three things, uh, commit, manage, and remedy. So speak out uh, on um, the importance of human rights to your organization, which is indeed context uh, specific, develop processes to manage those uh, human rights risks and impacts and engage actively with uh, victims of human rights abuses in case uh, something went wrong. So identifying your uh, adverse human rights impacts is really the key uh, thing to start with. Um, and 
that's, as I said, context specific. So for a, a company involved in palm oil, one of these sectors showed on, on Bronwyn's slide, uh, you may encounter different human rights issues than uh, when you're a pharmaceutical uh, company or when you're a textiles uh, manufacturer. Some companies uh, face uh, human rights issues in their uh, labor supply chain. Others uh, face the biggest human rights issues in community uh, relationships. Others in uh, consumer uh, related impacts. Uh, so it's, it's different for any company. And the challenging aspect of working for a bank is that we may finance companies in all of those sectors. So all their human rights risks are also uh, relevant for us uh, to take into account. Uh, and how that works is that uh, we've developed a policy framework uh, that addresses basically all uh, high risk sectors that ABN AMRO is active in. And we've come up with minimum uh, requirements, benchmark criteria to assess uh, whether our companies are living up to the UN guiding principles or on business and human rights. Um, um, it also addresses other uh, sustainability uh, uh, related uh, aspects, but it has a strong focus on, on uh, human rights. Um, so we ask a lot of questions uh, to clients, but we ask different questions to pharmaceutical companies than we ask chemicals producers or textiles manufacturers. Uh, and the purpose of that is to really get an honest idea of where do our, our companies uh, uh, stand, how do they do, and what room for improvement is there. Um, and that is also the call of the UN guiding principle. So if you identify any uh, specific risks or adverse impacts, there's no need to automatically uh, divest or pull back or disengage. Uh, instead, the UN guiding principles ask you to actively engage uh, with companies uh, and also with uh, people who may be affected by those uh, companies uh, to find solutions for human rights problems. Um, there's one big uh, exception, so to say, and that's the uh, tobacco sector, uh, where there is no uh, credible avenue for engagement or positive change uh, with these tobacco companies. So that is also why ABN AMRO uh, decided in 2017 uh, to stop lending to tobacco manufacturers and a year later also to exclude uh, tobacco manufacturing from all investment portfolios. Um, what is an interesting feature about the UN guiding principles and, and also something that we applied in our uh, decision to exclude uh, tobacco uh, is active stakeholder engagement. Uh, and companies may use different uh, definitions of, of who your stakeholders are, including your investors. Uh, but in the uh, human rights domain, your stakeholders are the people who you uh, affect or, or the people who are at risk of, of negative influence uh, from your company or their uh, legitimate representatives. Um, so we engaged a lot in uh, conversations with uh, public health organizations in the Netherlands, the Dutch Heart Foundation, tobacco-free portfolios, uh, and other initiatives uh, before uh, we reached the conclusion that uh, really the only uh, smart thing to do uh, in terms of tobacco was to exclude it, uh, but for other sectors where there is um, room for positive change to develop criteria and to actively engage with those uh, companies. Um, so that's in a nutshell the policy framework that we apply to, to companies covering many sustainability related uh, aspects much of, uh, much of uh, uh, which have to do with uh, public health. Um, we also report uh, on these issues, on these advancements, and that's another key element of the, of the framework to uh, make sure that you are accountable to your stakeholders and to anybody um, um, that has an interest in your, in your company, including investors, clients, governments, but in particularly uh, the affected stakeholders that you're uh, doing this work for. Uh, so in 2016, uh, we were the first bank globally to publish a standalone human rights uh, report. Uh, and in 2018, we uh, repeated uh, that effort. It's a highly qualitative report. So in our human rights report, uh, we explain what our policy framework looks like, uh, why it is uh, as it is, how we implement it, uh, but also what dilemmas we encounter or also the negative impacts uh, that we saw in our uh, activities. We report on our lending and investment portfolio, but we also report on other roles uh, that the bank has. For example, we have 5 million uh, retail clients in the Netherlands, uh, which uh, it's a whole different story, of course, in our corporate uh, clients. For the retail clients, 
uh, uh, people with bank accounts, mortgages, insurances, etc. Um, uh, that's that's also something that is clearly in scope of our human rights program, and also sometimes with health-related uh, uh, impacts that we encounter. It is uh, more difficult for an ex-cancer patient to get a mortgage um, uh, than for somebody uh, who has not suffered uh, from cancer, simply because some banks require uh, life insurances um, as an extra security, uh, which um, may be difficult or impossible to obtain when you're an ex-cancer patient. So all those um, um, issues come to light when you identify uh, your most salient human rights, rights risks as a company using this uh, framework provided by the UNGPs. Um, so we're proud of having this uh, human rights report in, in which we explain this uh, story. Uh, but as was also mentioned previously, uh, this year we published an additional uh, report uh, um, uh, presenting the integrated profit and loss account of AB and AMRO. So previously we reported on our uh, financials. Uh, this year we started to uh, report also on the other capitals uh, that were al already included in uh, the first presentation. So manufacturer capital, intellectual capital, social, hum uh, human capital, and natural capital. Uh, and it shows, uh, I think, an honest picture of the impact uh, that the bank has, uh, which, uh, of course, is positive on many fronts, but it is also negative uh, on, for example, natural capital and on some aspects of social and human uh, capital. Um, so the advancement, I think, brought by the UN guiding principles and also the IPNL methodology uh, that allows companies to publish uh, such reports is that um, companies open up uh, about what they do, but also about their, uh, the challenges that they face and the negative impacts uh, that occur. So the, the, the IPNL uh, account that we published, it, it, it's highly uh, quantitative. It contains a lot of green figures, uh, but it also contains a lot of red figures. And we uh, have decided to publish it anyhow uh, because uh, we need to uh, also expose those impacts uh, in order uh, for us to uh, to manage them uh, and to improve. I think in the years forward, you will see uh, refinement of the integrated profit and loss methodology, capturing uh, uh, more and more sophisticated, uh, in a more sophisticated way, all the impacts that companies uh, may have. And it will uh, really start to be a, um, a method for companies to manage all their uh, impacts, both positive and negative, on uh, people and planet. Um, in that uh, effort, uh, as I said, stakeholder engagement uh, is uh, crucial. Um, it's, it's a key part of uh, my work, of the work we do um, in the sustainability department uh, of ABN Emro. Um, and it's also one of the reasons why I like to present at conferences to engage with you in a uh, discussion uh, about these issues. So I'll end with this and I'll, um, I'm looking uh, forward to the uh, Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Ruben. Okay, now everybody, what you can't see is that Alana's phone keeps telling us that she's been sitting down for too long and has to stand up. So that means all of us need to quickly stand up just for a moment and we're going to play a little game that you should enjoy, Mark. I want everybody, so just we'll stand up for just a sec. I want everybody to stay standing. If you'd be happy to save $100 on your yearly insurance, if you were walked an extra kilometre a day, every day, would you be happy uh, to do that if you'd save $100 on your insurance? Stay standing if you're happy to do that. There's some nice research for you. Stay standing if you'd be happy to do it for two movie tickets. Okay, sit down then. Sit down if you're not happy. See, not so happy. No. And now stay standing if you'd be happy to do it for how many coffees? You're going to have to get more than one. Let's no, one. 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 one cup of coffee every week. <laughs> oh, one cup of coffee a week. Are you happy to walk an extra kilometre a day for one coffee a week? Wow. Okay, brilliant. There we go. You can thank, thank me later for that. Thank All right, we can take a seat. There we go. We all feel a tiny bit more awake and Alana's phone can calm down. Now, I'd just like to open the Q&A. Now, we are going to run out of time here, so I would like to take some audience Q&A. We'll just f start with one question for each of the panel, first of all. Pavan, you mentioned um, that we need a Greta for food systems. Yeah. I actually think we need a Greta for tobacco. We need a Greta for all sorts of things. Yeah. But 
can you tell us really, is there hope for change in the food sector? The sum of the data you presented was overwhelming and it seems like there's, um, there's an awful long way to go. But is there hope? How are we going to change this? Yeah, th there is hope at, at many levels. Um, so uh, literally at the grassroots level, at the farmer level, I've seen examples of natural farming. There's one from my home country in India, uh, where in Andhra Pradesh, which is a state in the Indian, in, in India, where they have almost 600,000 farmers who've signed up for natural farming, which means zero pesticides, zero fertilizers made out of chemicals. Uh, they've reinvented historical wisdom uh, they've recognized that agriculture is actually about biology, not chemistry. And they've gone ahead using communities as their support base, sharing knowledge, sharing experiences, understanding what works where based on soil and climate conditions and water conditions. It's working. Yields are higher. People are happier. They, are, they don't, they, you know, the, <laughs> there are no more people going for kidney diseases and cancer trains and stuff like that. And food definitely tastes better, you're quite right. And it's healthier as well, it, nutrition improves. So there's positive examples. And on the flip side, I think companies are beginning to understand that the time is up, essentially. And companies are not run by careless or foolish people. They're, they're basically perhaps too greedy sometimes for their own good. But they're beginning to recognize that the, the end of the line is nigh. And if you don't change your business model, you cannot keep generating profits and therefore capital appreciation anymore. So I think they're beginning to explore the areas and seeing can we actually help aggregate these small farmers? Can we actually leverage sectors like the, the, new, the new generations who are more interested in healthy food and chemical-free food? Can we actually make natural farming more profitable? So it's happening. Fantastic. Um, over to you, Ulana. You mentioned a whole lot of healthcare reform and the impacts on the commercial determinants of health. What about other reforms? It sounds like so much was going on in the Ukraine. There's so many stories for all of us to learn from. What other uh, reform has led to impacts on health? Um, some of the lack of reform has led to negative uh, impacts on health. For instance, some um, uh, judiciary reform has been long in coming in Ukraine. There's been some changes at the level of the Supreme Court, but in the lower level courts, not much has changed. And uh, the KU City Council very intelligently banned the sale of alcohol between um, uh, 11 p.m. to uh, 8 o'clock in the morning unless it was inside a restaurant. So no sale of alcohol because alcohol is a problem in, uh, in Ukraine. It causes a lot of Im uh, negative impact on health. And the lower court, um, uh, the uh, uh, alcohol uh, uh, distributors and manufacturers uh, sued the city of Kyiv and the lower court decided that it was the human right of every Ukrainian to buy alcohol in the middle of the night and to have access to it rather than thinking about the health implications. And really the reason that it happened is because it was bribery done in the judges um, in the court system and uh, not much has changed in a very long time. When that went higher into the appellate court, it actually was overturned and the, the law now continues to stand. But the lack of reform in certain areas, such as judiciary reform, can really cause problems because unless you have laws that are passed by parliament that are then enforced by law enforcement and you have a judiciary system and the rule of law that um, allows for um, the law to be um, uh, monitored, that it uh, isn't broken and that people are uh, sticking to the regulations, that there's some sort of penalty at the end, nothing will ever change. And um, in, uh, in a, a society where um, many people think only of tomorrow and not of next week, next year, or five years from now, unfortunately, that's been the history in Ukraine because of the uh, cycle of um, tragedies that have happened from you know, being invaded in, uh, in five years ago and the Crimea's annexed. Um, there's a, a, a war going on in eastern Ukraine. People don't feel stability. And uh, that was one of the things that you talk about with stability and um, uh, consistency over time. People don't feel that, so they only worry about the next day rather than the long term. It makes it very hard to convince uh, government to pay for public health uh, programs and to talk to people about um, uh, healthy living. However, the youth is very different. And as you said, it's really the young people that are changing in the mindset. And that's the hope that as they um, grow older, as they come into positions of power, that much more will be, um, uh, much more sustainable change will happen so that uh, impact is made in a positive way on health. We spend too much money treating disease and not enough money preventing the disease. Business spends too much money 
on um, making things easier for people, fast food, rather than uh, providing for healthy foods for uh, people uh, to have so that they can live healthier lives. Very wise words. I, I agree with that and I think it really ties into, Mark, what you were saying about uh, AIA is abandoning. You put it so nicely, you die, we pay. Um, and you, you know, you've really got a, a, a purpose-led strategy at AIA now and I mean it's almost like the buzzword in the corporate sector at the moment is everybody's being asked to define their purpose and live to the purpose and, and redefine their work according to that. How would you describe that purpose now at AIA? Uh, good question. Uh, in short, it, it's really around sustainability through social impact. Um, and, and that being, as I said, basically helping people be healthier for longer. Uh, that's, that's, it's good for our business and it, it's good for them, of course. So, so that, that, that would simply be it. C can I share with you, just, just quickly on, on, on the great point, there's some statistics uh, in, in Asia. So we have a... We, we, we have a, a big problem in Asia, not just the rapidly aging population, but rapidly um, increases in obesity and diabetes. If you take China, I don't, I, I don't know if you could guess, how many people do you think are suffering from diabetes in China today? This is, this is a population of one billion? One billion people, So yeah. how many people have diabetes? Yeah. How many people have diabetes in China? Yeah, 100, yeah, that, that, so that, that or 125 million people suffer from diabetes in China. If you put those people together and formed a country, it'd be about the 11th biggest country in the world. Not a very healthy country. And that AI, AI Vitality program I showed you, we, 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 so we're nowhere near those numbers. We've got about a million and a half members. When people take out that program, we do basic biometric testing. Things like their BMI, their cholesterol uh, markers, and blood pressure. People who engage in that program, 21% of those people move from unhealthy BMI to healthy BMI. 38% of people move from unhealthy cholesterol markers to healthy cholesterol markers. And 56% of people move from unhealthy blood pressure to healthy blood pressure. Now, that's not gonna change the world, but there we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who now through a simple, pr or of a cup, seriously, a cup of coffee or a cinema ticket are improving their health. So that's the type of thing we should be doing. And Mark, can I ask, you said you've got one million people in that, but you've got yeah. about 34 million policyholders. Yeah. Is there um, sort of concern or fear or reluctance around signing up to a program like yeah. that because they monitor all your data? Is, uh, uh, is the average person on the street in Asia worried about data collection and privacy? Yeah, there, there are actually two factors, Bronwyn. So, so no, not really. I mean, particularly in China, I, th I, th I think they, they, they know they're, they're being monitored. Um, so. Uh, there are people, of course, who, who don't want to, to be tracked. Uh, so, so, so don't want their sleep tracked, don't want their, their activity tracked, don't want their eating tracked. Uh, fair enough, so, so not everybody does that. But it basically comes down to still, um, life insurance and health insurance is not something you wake up with every morning and say, oh, I need to buy that. Um, and so it is really still a distribution, oh, pardon me, I've knocked your name off, Ron Wayne. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it still needs to be sold. Uh, and our agents find it quite complicated, actually, to explain this this uh, this reward program and the changing of, a, of, a, of our business, rather than just being to protect you against bad things, that actually we're going to prevent these bad things happening. So it's that's almost gamification of health. It like is. it's a it's a game. It it almost sounds fun, and I imagine that young people would buy into it very easily. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So so uh, it's it. <laughs> But it's not rocket science. It's, it's, it's what our mothers and grandmothers have always told us. Go out and play. Go out and run around a bit. Don't eat, you know, eat properly. Sleep properly. Don't smoke. Don't drink alcohol. So it's not, but, but we're human beings, so we have to encourage them. Uh, and it's not easy. Thank you. And Ruben, I wanted to ask around, um, ABN AMRO, you said, was the first bank to publish a human rights report. Last year, um, you published an integrated PL and reported on all of these things that, some people might feel a bit sort of ashamed or worried about being so transparent on. So you said that there were some negative things that you reported on, but you did it. And there's a lot of talk in the corporate sector around embracing radical transparency. And um, it requires a bit of courage and boldness to do that. Your company has got through that and is doing it. How do you think we can bring other companies along to follow in your footsteps and, and be uh, less afraid of being more transparent? Um, 
Yeah, I think what, what made the difference uh, for us that um, at a very early stage after, um, so the UN guiding principles are accompanied by a, a reporting framework. Uh, and we were uh, with Unilever and Nestle, one of the first companies to embrace that framework and commit to reporting um, uh, on that basis. That was the decision of a very small group of people. Um, because when you start that reporting journey, you do not net yet uh, know what you're going to encounter, right? So the decision to commit to doing a report and follow a certain methodology um, is a, a quite a small step in that sense. Uh, if you just present it as, hey guys, but we should know what is going on and we should know uh, uh, the uh, positive impacts we make, but we should also know what kind of negative impacts we make. And that's, um, um, I think the biggest lesson that if you present it that way, it's just a tool to obtain more knowledge, uh, then you don't encounter so much resistance internally. Um, it's the start of a, an, an internal process to get people on board because we uh, in the group sustainability function do not know uh, everything, uh, what is happening uh, in different business lines, etc. So uh, we um, uh, expanded a, a community, uh, an internal uh, community with uh, uh, people uh, in all the different business lines and functions that would be sort of our liaisons uh, for that project to collect all this information. Uh, and from there we went all on to, um, for the human rights report, basically telling the story and for the IPNL to, um, uh, to, to uh, do the calculations. Um, and I think the only at the end of that journey you come towards, okay, what are we going to uh, disclose and how comfortable we are with that, but um, um, at that moment, it's also a bit of a, a, a moment of no return uh, that you've passed because you've clearly committed to publish these reports. Um, and what also helped was that we received very positive feedback uh, from, um, 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 from our stakeholders in being so open and transparent. So um, uh, there was uh, there, there are a, a number of, of dilemmas and, and, and adverse impacts that we reported on, uh, and on none of these, uh, we received an email from an NGO or a trade union uh, saying, um, how the hell could, could this have happened uh, at Abbey and Emerald because we thought you were working so hard and now you report. No, they were actually quite open um, and, and, and happy with that. And that's um, uh, also how we approach our clients, right? So we have clients in the cocoa sector uh, where everybody knows that there is a child labor problem in Ghana and Ivory Coast. Uh, so if we assess uh, a client in the cocoa sector and that client uh, says uh, we've encountered 1,600 instances of child labor in our supply chain, we say, well, great, great, for, and great that you reported because only when you find out you can actually do something with that. And I trust that company more than a company that says, well, there's absolutely, uh, we know that th this is a systemic problem in the countries where we operate. However, in our supply chain, uh, you will never find any, uh, we're uh, so distrust that, co that company and uh, engage with the company that is, that is um, um, yeah, transparent and, and willing to share uh, dilemmas. Great, I'm gonna turn over to the audience now. Yes, if, uh, I think we need an one, uh, one microphone. Okay, so was it here? Yeah. yeah. So one, two, we've got four. So just down the front. Thank you, uh, Nicole Dupala from uh, Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies here in Potsdam. Uh, my question is for Mark. Uh, first, if this free coffee is with sugar, or <laughs> because that would be a problem. The second question would be, um, we talked a lot about the behavior of, of individuals, right? It's about what they're doing, if they're walking or not. But one of the systemic problems is the environment they're living with, you know, the quality of water, the quality of food, pesticides, and all this. So what's the role of insurance companies that could help with, you know, mixing this uh, um, problems that is more systemic related to environment protection? Um, I, I believe we have a big role that we can play there as well. Uh, and so, but, but it's one step at a time for us, to be honest. So, so go, going to that, that the coffee, I mean, actually on a more serious note, um, when people go to the supermarkets in, in Hong Kong um, or Singapore or any of our markets, uh, their shopping list, anything that is deemed to be a healthy food choice gets a 10% discount thanks to AI Vitality. So we have partners with, with the supermarket chain, so, so we actually encourage them to buy healthy foods uh, and they get discounts for that. 
Um, people may put sugar in their coffees, but we, you know, who knows? Uh, um, more widely, uh, so we're, we're, we're dealing with the problems that we can deal with, the easy ones first. The environmental ones are, are bigger. Um, we are doing things on air quality, particularly China's got a very bad reputation for that. Actually, you'll be pleased to know the air quality in China in many of the areas is now, is now under control. The government have really turned their attention to it. We've got a bigger problem in Hong Kong, to be honest. Um, so all we can do is, is um, we, we reward people, but ultimately as well, a lot of our clients are corporations. We've got 16 million members of, of corporate schemes, 120,000 corporate clients. We can reward those corporate clients for, for doing the right thing uh, with, with uh, environment and society more generally. Okay. okay. Just we'll have quick questions and quick answers. We've only got we've only got about five minutes left, All so right. I can okay. see there's about three more. Thank you for insightful panel. Uh, my name is Amit Fakim from Iran. I have two questions: one for Mark and one for Paban. Uh, you are uh, doing this business in Hong Kong, one of the most wealthiest countries on this planet. This helps for universalized coverage as well, but the problem is, is just giving coffee to people on this kind of incentives, specifically in the context of low and mid-income countries, is not going to work because the burden of NCDs are from those countries as well, much higher than the burden of NCDs in high-income countries. And conventionally, insurance companies are not designed to do this because you want to make money. So the thing is how you feel this w model can be sustainable, specifically for in the context of poor countries in order to change the culture. That's a question for you. And my question for you is health in all policies has been uh, in the context for the at least the last, last 10, 15 years. And, uh, but still, uh, governments and international organizations, they don't have any plan for this kind of multi-sector and holistic view towards making the policies. How do you think uh, you can, as the UN ambassador, to do something with um, strengthening the governance of the countries to understand this multi-sectorality? What's the model at least the countries can learn from in order to do this? Thanks. Okay, so, so um, very quickly response to your question. So, so in so some of the other markets you work, in, like Myanmar, let me give Myanmar an example, an extreme from Hong Kong or Singapore. We reward people there, actually the youth, by getting them, they can meet with David Beckham, who is our global ambassador promoting vitality. They get trained by Tottenham Hotspur Spurs coaches. Uh, so we do foot football and, and uh, general physical education activities for all age, age ranges. So as a reward of doing things, community exercises that they would never have been exposed to otherwise. That's what motivates them, and that's, that's obviously good and easy for us to do. Fixing food policies really can be done at any point along the value chain. You could begin with land use change, which is typically environment ministry. You could go from there to... Uh, agriculture, which is the agriculture ministry, then go from there to commerce, which is a supplier of various goods and services to agriculture, and then go from there to retail, which is commerce ministry again, and so on. And then somewhere along the line is health, not just health of the farmers, but also health of the consumers. So I think the challenge today, I think, goes into the SDG arena, because the SDGs also are like that. We can't solve any major problem by focusing on one single SDG. The moment you're touching food, you are automatically touching SDG, that is two, uh, touching 14 and 15 in terms of food supplies and six in terms of water, 13 on climate, three on health, etc. This challenge of breaking the silos, I think, will really be helped by people and governments embracing the SDGs. They are complex. That's the first thing that I will admit about them. But let's embrace that complexity. And let's see that as a positive thing to break the ministerial silos in which solutions and policy solutions typically are formed. We need to just stop doing that. And I think now with the SDGs, we have a hat to hang on. Anyone who has an idea which is cross-sectoral can say, but you know, I need to do this SDG and therefore you and you and you have to be involved and sit together with finance and get the money in place. So I think we have a mechanism to move this forward. Whether it succeeds or not, I don't know. I hope it does. Thank you, Matt. Now I can see there's four more people. We'll take one, two, three, and four, and then we'll have to uh, finish it off. Thank you. N Neil Squires, Public Health England. I I'm interested in the practicalities of measuring uh, externalities. So in the UK, we work with food industry to reformulate food, and we've had companies like Greggs and KFC reducing fat, sugar, salt. But how would you actually, if you're going to make an investment decision, determine whether they reduce their sugar and fat and salt enough to be a healthy product so that you could inform investment decisions on the basis of the change? Because some products, like a sausage roll, is never going to be healthy. It might be healthier, but it's never going to be a healthy product. 
Uh, so can you make investment decisions on more complex things like food? It's easy to disinvest in tobacco, but food is much more complex. Uh, Daniela De Biase, Sapienza, University of Rome. I have a question for Mark. Uh, for many people actually in this summit, I heard very little about neurodegenerative diseases. So if you extend your life to 120 years and you spend the last 20 years with Alzheimer, well, I don't know. <laughs> a comment, just a comment. Yeah, no, no it is it's a great comment and, and obviously that I think that's the next big thing. Uh, so, so cancer, is a, there's a lot of advancement under for cancers. We, we know about that. This thing inside here is very complex, and uh, yeah, that, that, that is the next big th threat, and we need to deal with that. On uh, the great question on uh, the challenges of measuring externalities, they are severe. And uh, step one is to just limit your, your frame in terms of what part of the value chain are you accounting for and what products or what divisions of the company you're accounting for. Once you've done that, then it's all about data, data, data. Uh, we find that my company, Just Advisory, basically does that as its business. And we've perforce had to do things like just measure air, to measure air pollution impacts, for instance. We need to gather global wind speed and wind direction data, global uh, literally down to locations, uh, global data on population densities as to where the pollution lands, and then finally WHO health costs and so on. So there's no running away from this. It is a really complex world, but I think this the idea is to just get straight in there and, and immerse yourself. Uh, the beauty is that there's so much good research. The example I quoted is, is basically on endocrine disruption. It touches on neurological diseases as well. And these are actual serious. We were able, in the case of Yarra Valley Water, Melbourne's water utility, to give them an estimate of what was the impact of their program to help children get away from drinking sugar, sugar sweetened beverages by using Choose Tap, a kind of fizzy bottle that they fill up because we knew the cost of dental caries across Melbourne. So we were able to calculate what the benefit was. So there are just ways of doing this, but you just have to put in that effort in the research. No, no easy solutions, I'm sorry. You know, there is no silver bullet. I'm the first person to say that. Um, hi, Abdullah Zernmetz, um, German Medical Student Association, Vice President from Germany. Um, I have a question to Mark. Uh, I think I'm, I feel like I'm the only one who is a bit scared <laughs> of your presentation. In the beginning, as a medical student, I was like thinking, oh, good idea. But then in the end, I was like, oh, so much data, and you can influence people so strongly. And then I heard you have partnership with companies, and then maybe saying, like, this product is good, buy this, you will get discounts, and on this product not. Uh, how is, like, your philosophy, or are you working, do you want to work with the government, or, um, yeah, and in general, what is your, uh, like, is health, we have a topic later, uh, data, global, public, good? Uh, like the data you're collecting and yeah, I feel like a bit scared as a medical student doctor, like, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, didn't mean to scare you, but but but, it, but I mean the whole issue of data and data privacy is scary, right, but obviously as an insurance company, we have to we have to be utmost care over the privacy of date, data. If, if we were in any way to misuse data or to commercialize it, uh, that, that would adversely impact our business. So, so, so we have to take utmost care of, of all data, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, so, so anyway, so you don't, don't, don't really want to scare you. Um, there are, uh, what we do in terms of choosing our partners is quite simple. Which ones have clinical efficacy? Which ones can demonstrate that they actually deliver better health outcomes for people? So the medics one, for example, you saw the numbers 23% and 22% on my presentation. This is Hong Kong and Singapore. 23% of cancer diagnoses were incorrect. And through, and so that, that's no fault. Other than some great experts in Hong Kong and Singapore. But it's hard to keep up with, with the advancement in understanding cancers. And 22% of those avoided unnecessary treatments. And as you know, for cancer, that's brutal chemotherapy or surgery. 22% of people, because of the service we've provided, because of what we, we've seen uh, they can do, uh, have avoided unnecessary surgery. Uh, so that's making a positive difference in people's lives. So, so w it's simple. Can you demonstrate clinical efficacy, improve better outcomes and better well-being for people? Then we'll partner with you. Otherwise, we won't. Last question. Thank you. Um, I'm Tayyip Abdul Karim, a Nigerian Commonwealth Scholar studying in the UK. Um, my question is about the partners that you have. Do you have partners in the African region who believe in what you believe in? Possibly have signed into um, the initiatives, the Tobacco Free Pledge, for example. 
how we can follow up with these conversations to push things further? Thank you. Oh, it's a great question. So we, um, we're a very small charity. Uh, my partner in crime is standing here in the middle, maybe just put your hand up there. This is Dr. Rachel Melson, who's based in the UK and leads our work all throughout Europe. We're about to appoint a new director in the USA, um, but we don't have a presence in uh, any, you know, in Africa, in South America, in Asia. We do uh, spend a lot of time uh, visiting those places and interacting with the financial organisations there, um, but we don't have a, a presence on the ground. We do connect with, it's been a great pleasure just over the past few days to meet many um, African health ministers and uh, make them aware of our work. And in fact, the real link there is if your government signed and ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, so 181 countries have done that, if that's the case, then in fact your government is required to have any government money tobacco free. So that means any public pension fund, any sovereign wealth fund, any public insurance agency is required to have a tobacco-free approach. Now, that hasn't been very well communicated to the finance ministers in all of these countries. And so we certainly do uh, you know, appreciate any connections in government, in any nation, to make sure that those provisions of the UN Tobacco Control Treaty, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, are really um, sort of highlighted to the people who can make change. So thank you for your question. I'm just going to finish off, just ask for a one-minute comment from each person. You've got a great room full of global health leaders here. What is your call to action? How can the people in this audience help you with, uh, with your work from your point of view regarding um, where we are now and where we'd like to be in the next five or ten years? To request if you have an articulate 15, 16-year-old, talk to her about the importance of food systems and health and sorting them out. And second is, if you are working in a company, ask your CFO, how would he like to, for a change, measure real performance and not just financial performance? And tell him that, yes, it's possible. You've seen it being done. I think governments should get more involved in um, working together with business so that uh, the reports that are generated uh, when human rights um, evaluations are done that um, it isn't seen as a negative, but a positive. And for all of us to remember that transparency may show good things as well as bad things, we shouldn't criticize for that. Instead, we should move forward and help to correct the mistakes that have been made in the past. Only transparency and working together, uh, business, uh, civil society, and government will make the changes that we need to see in the world so that we are healthier, and that someday we li will live to be 120 years old. Uh, healthy and um, with grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, and maybe even great-great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, that, so, so, so that was great. Uh, um, could I'll just take a different perspective on that, and let's make this personal. I mean, who is responsible for your health? We are. We are, right? So my takeaway is every single one of you in this room take responsibility for your own health. Do a bit of physical activity. I'm not saying become an ultra distance runner or a boxer like I don't, don't you don't just a bit of physical activity. Don't eat so much and eat better quality. Don't smoke and don't drink too much alcohol. Um, I know the beer is very good here. But so so take responsibility for yourself and then influence your friends and family and your employers and organizations that the biggest social and economic issue facing this world today is aging and aging in ill health. 40 years in ill health with no money is not, is not a very bright future. So we need to take responsibility ourselves and influence everybody we can. That's my request to everybody in this room. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, Bronwyn's uh, slides uh, clearly showed how companies are increasingly moving, moving from a model where they um, uh, respond to shareholder concerns to a model where they uh, respond to uh, stakeholder concerns and are, are actively engaging with their uh, stakeholders. You see all these uh, initiatives and frameworks uh, that I also touched upon uh, popping up uh, that help companies do that. In all these frameworks, the central element is active engagement with stakeholders. Uh, on the issue of public health, um, that includes you. Um, uh, so find the companies that you are interested in, that you have a problem with or you see room for improvement whether it's the tobacco sector, and you have a clear message on financial divestment or uh, other uh, companies that uh, impact uh, uh, health, uh, and get a seat at the table.
Thank you. And just to finish off, my call to action would be everybody in the audience um, has more power than perhaps we think we have on an individual level. You all have a bank account and um, your, that bank deserves you as a customer, but to deserve you, um, it would be good if that bank would make sure that they're not lending money to the tobacco industry. And uh, it's a very reasonable question to ask a bank these days. Are you lending money to the tobacco industry? Um, most of you will have a pension fund, or many of you will have a pension fund. Ask your pension fund, are they investing your money in tobacco companies? If you have an insurance company, ask them, are they investing your insurance premium in tobacco companies? They're very simple questions, and it just doesn't make sense for people who are really committed to global health to have their own money working against them. So, um, you know, I, I really like the idea of, you know, take control of your health but take control of the choices that you make as a consumer as well and hold companies to account and, and help them to improve their own um, actions as, um, as uh, corporate players that need to work alongside governments and the health sector. So thank you to all of our esteemed panel today. It's been a great pleasure to host you here and uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you.